Now, after these incidents of Muslims being tortured, a very important stage came in the religion of Islam. Quraysh would continue to torture these Muslims. Many of them did not have a powerful family to defend them. The situation was just unbearable. And the Prophet knew that this cannot continue. These evil Meccans are going to torture, they're going to kill. He had to come up with a solution for those Muslims who were really uh, being tortured. They needed a refuge. They needed to go somewhere where they could practice their faith. Quraysh also needed to know that their efforts are futile. You cannot stop Islam, you cannot stop Muslims. So the Prophet is inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to come up with the idea of migration. Which migration? This is now in the fifth year after receiving revelation, the fifth year of Ba'tha. The migration to Habasha, Abyssinia. Abyssinia is modern day Ethiopia in Africa, southwest of Mecca. The Prophet comes up with an idea. He tells the Muslims, those who were going through persecution and they were being tortured, he told them, migrate temporarily to Abyssinia. Why Abyssinia? Why not some other place? A number of reasons. Number one, distance. It was very close to Mecca because all you had to do is get to the coast. You know, it's about maybe 50 miles from Mecca. If you go west, you'll hit the coast of the Red Sea. You cross the Red Sea, which is not a wide sea, right? It's a narrow sea. You cross the Red Sea, you arrive at Ethiopia. So it was very short. The distance was short. Whereas Syria, Rome, Persia were far places. Number two, the Quraysh, the Meccans, had economic ties with the Romans and the Syrians. They would, you know, frequently travel there to do business. So if these migrants would have gone to Syria, the Meccans would have pressured the leaders of Syria to send them back. And why could they pressure them? Economic ties. If you want us to do business with you, O Syrians, send back these Muslims. So the Prophet had to choose an area which the Quraysh had no ties with. The best place was Ethiopia because the Meccans, the Quraysh had nothing to do with Ethiopia. No business ties, no transactions really. So they had no influence. That's the second reason. The third reason the Prophet ﷺ, he himself explains, he tells the Muslims, The Prophet says there's a king, a good king in Ethiopia. He does not oppress anyone, he's just. And it's a land of truth. And whoever seeks refuge in that king, he treats him in a good way. So the Prophet gives them this suggestion. Muslims, flee this persecution, go to Ethiopia. Now the Prophet's words, Ardu Sidqin, land of truth, indicates that the people of Ethiopia, those Africans, were good-hearted people. You know, they had their fitra, they were worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sincerely, it was a healthy community and society. It was generally speaking morally upright. It was a good environment for those Muslims. Now what was their religion? They were Christians. The king of Abyssinia was Christian. They were on the path of Prophet Isa salam, on the correct path of Prophet Isa salam. Now Najashi, that's his name. The name of the king was Najashi. Now the Prophet also did not want to send them to Rome or Persia because the Romans were idol worshippers. The Persians were not monotheists either. They were Majus or some other religions. The Prophet sent them to people of the book. He sent them to a monotheistic society that believes in Allah and the Prophets of God. So that was the closest, best place where the Prophet chose for those early Muslims, yes. Najashi, yes, Najashi, yes, Najashi, I believe 
either him or maybe his father. Yes, like yeah, see, a, a, Abraha initially was good, he was Christian, then he defected, he became corrupt. So Abraha was initially Christian, he was sent by the Christian leaders to Yemen, but then once he solidified his power, he became corrupt and he wanted to demolish the Kaaba. So he may have had something to do with Najashi, either that Najashi or maybe his father. Because remember, this Najashi, the Prophet at this time is 45 years old. And the Prophet was born the year of the elephant, so it's unlikely that it was him. So even if you see the word Najashi, maybe it was his father. You know, the king of Abyssinia is called Najashi. Like Qaisar, the Caesar of Rome, is not one person. The king of Rome was called Caesar, so the same probably applies to Najashi. So the Prophet, he tells them to go to uh, Abyssinia. However, he tells them not to go at once. He tells them leave secretly in groups. How many Muslims went in that migration? About 83 or 82? So some 82, 83 Muslims went to Abyssinia. The Prophet told them, look, if Quraysh realizes that you're going, they will persecute you. So go secretly. So the first group, they didn't go at, they didn't go at once. The first group were 14 people, 10 men, 4 women. 10 men and 4 women went, they reached the Red Sea, Quraysh found out that 14 Muslims are migrating somewhere, they chased them to the Red Sea. When they got to the Red Sea, it was too late, the Muslims had already taken a boat to the other side. Now another reason why the Prophet sent them to Abyssinia is because Quraysh had no naval force, they had no clue how to navigate a boat, so if you're on a boat, that's it, you're safe. Whereas if you try to go to Syria, oh, they had horses, they, within a day they could reach you. Mm -hmm. So that was another reason why the Prophet ﷺ chose Abyssinia. Quraysh just had no way of going and attacking them there. They were safe once they got to the other side. The Muslims? No, they were not happy, we'll see why. They were not happy, this disappointed them big time. So that's the first group that goes, um, Uthman ibn Mad'un, that great companion, he was you know one of them who went on that migration to Ethiopia. Um Salama, the wife of the Prophet she also is one of the migrants, later she becomes the wife of the Prophet, at this time of course she wasn't, she was the wife of Abu Salama. Abu Salama, Um Salama, they go, they were a family who migrated to Abyssinia, now these incidents that we'll discuss now are narrated by Um Salama. She tells us exactly what happened there. Now why were the Quraysh ticked off? Remember Quraysh wanted power and to suffocate Islam. When the Muslims leave and migrate, they have the freedom to spread Islam. Now they're no longer in your control. And that encourages more people to become Muslim and then migrate. They did not like that. It was an embarrassment for them. Because Quraysh initially they dismissed Islam, ah, the stupid religion, these crazy followers, in one night will crush them. They couldn't. When they escaped, they realized this is serious. They're now out of our control. From Ethiopia, they will spread Islam. And really the seeds of Africa becoming Muslim was this migration. Why do you think so many African nations are Muslim? The seed, the seed of it, was planted by Ja'far, the brother of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Majority of the majority of the people Today, today there is a sizable Muslim population in Ethiopia, but the majority are Christians. That in later in history, there were many uh, political reasons, but I'm talking about Africa as a whole, Northern Africa. Why are most Northern African countries Muslims? Many factors, one of them was this this migration, so this really solidified Islam. Now the Prophet ﷺ, he appointed Ja'far, the brother of Imam Ali ﷺ, to be the spokesperson and the leader of the Muslims. So when those 82, 83 Muslims gathered in Ethiopia, who was their leader? Ja'far, the brother of Imam Ali ﷺ, Ja'far al-Tayyar. Now there are some claims that Uthman ibn Affan, he was the first person to migrate with his family. This is contradicted, this is doubtful, why? 
because this is contradicted by historical reports that the first family to migrate was Abu Salama and Um Salama. And if they mean the first individual to migrate, this is also contradicted by reports that state uh, Salit or Sulayt ibn Amr or Hatib ibn Abi Amr, they were the first to migrate. So this is doubtful because we have contradictory reports. We don't know if Uthman really, Uthman ibn Affan was the first, you know, of the companions to migrate. There are reasons for us to reject that or at least doubt that. Yeah, I was about to ask that. Did he accept So, so the event of Habasha was around fifth or sixth year. It seems that he had just accepted Islam. Yes. Now. Yes. Is the verse in Surah Al Imran where the Lord says, "Is this about Najashi, or was it revealed in his honor?" What surah is this? The second to last verse of Ali Imran. Ali Imran. Ali Imran is mainly a Madani uh, surah. I don't recall now. I can look at the tafsir and double check. But Ali Imran, as far as I remember, it's a Madani uh, surah. Maybe just that verse. It does happen quite often that you have a chapter that's Madani, but maybe some verses are Mecki. Yeah, that may be possible. I doubt it, but I'll check inshallah. Now, when the Quraysh became furious that these Muslims fled, they dispatched two representatives. Amr ibn al-As, that person who was anti-Imam Ali alayhi salam, and Imara ibn Walid, remember Imara was that youth whom they wanted to trade with the Prophet when they made that offer with Abu Talib, the brother of Khalid ibn Walid. They sent these two to represent the Quraysh and to negotiate with the Najashi. They went, they met Najashi, Najashi had given refuge to those 82, 83 Muslims. They were led by Ja'far, the brother of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Now when they met Najashi, they told Najashi, they brought them uh, gifts, luxurious gifts. They gave it to Najashi and his aides, the aides were very you know, happy that they got all these gifts. So they were willing to negotiate with them, why have you come here? They told them, look, the elders of Mecca have sent us. And the reason why here we're here, these 82 Muslims, they're corrupt, they've abandoned our religion, they've caused a rift in our society, they've come up with it, they've invented a new religion. It's not our religion, it's not even your religion, you're a Christian, they're not even Christians. So we ask you respectfully to send them back to Mecca, their families, their uncles are waiting for them. Najashi was just and he was smart. Najashi said, now this was an enticing offer because you're getting a lot of gifts. Najashi said, I have to hear them first. You've presented your case. Let me hear their case. So he calls upon them. Who is your spokesperson? Ja'far al-Tayya. Ja'far ibn Abu Talib, the brother of Imam Ali alayhi salam. He was their spokesperson. He tells him, oh Ja'far, this person, you heard their claim, what do you, what's your response to that? He said, O oh King, O oh Najashi, we were a group of people in Mecca, a society that did everything immoral, everything corrupt, we worshipped, and when he says we, meaning the Meccan society, we worshipped idols, we had no sanctity for life, uh, adultery was co uh, committed, no respect for women, and we'd bury the infants alive. And he mentions all those negative things that happened in Meccan society. Then God sends us a messenger who taught us how to worship the one God, to reject the idols. He enjoins the good. He teaches us how to give charity. He teaches us how to look after the orphan. And he's made all these vices haram. And he mentions and he mentions and he mentions. Najashi is surprised. He's like, well, I'm hearing very good things about this Prophet, very excellent things about this Prophet. Then he tells him, he's heard about some verses from the Quran that this you know, final Prophet has some verses. He tells him, can you read a few verses for us? Let me hear, what does this Muhammad teach you? Smart, Ja'far was smart. 
which chapter does he read? Surat Maryam. He says, yes, Najashi, I'll read it for you. He begins, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Kaf ha ya ayn saad, dhikru rahmati rabbika abdahu zakariya, idh nada rabbahu nida'an khafiya. He begins the story. Remember the story of Zakariya, how he did not have children. He prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to get children. And then he transitions into the story of Maryam, her virgin birth, and Jesus alayhi salam. Imagine Ja'far. Ibn Abi Talib reciting these verses, historical accounts say the beard of Najashi becomes soaked with tears when he hears these words. After Ja'far finishes these words, Najashi tells him, I swear by God, these are the teachings of Isa ibn Maryam. What you just read is what we believe in. These are the teachings of Isa ibn Maryam. He tells those two, go back. I'm not going to release a single Muslim, go back. They're very embarrassed now, they don't know what to do. What should they tell the elders of Quraysh? We failed in our mission. Now Amr ibn al-As, who was more evil than Amara, Amr ibn al-As, he says, tomorrow I've got a plan. I'm going to mention something, he's going to execute them all. Amara tells him, don't. They have family, there are, there are distant relatives, don't do this to them. He says, no, I will. The next day, he goes to Najashi and he tells him, Najashi, ask them what they believe about Jesus. They say he's a slave. He doesn't say that. Amr ibn al-As, he just says slave. He calls them, he tells them, what's your belief in Jesus? Tell us. They become nervous. So they decide, should we tell him, should we do taqiyya or no? <laughs> Ja'far and the companions, they say, look, let's say the truth. As God says it, we're not going to change any aspect of the truth. Whatever happens, happens, even if he kills us. He wasn't going to kill them, he was probably going to send them back. He tells him, now Ja'far, the spokesperson, he tells Najashi, we believe that Jesus is Abdullah, the slave of Allah. And Ruhullah, he's the spirit of Allah, and the word of Allah that he gave to Maryam. Abdullah, wa Ruhullah, wa kalimatuhu alqaha ila Maryam. You know what Najashi says? Historical accounts say Najashi, there were some sticks on the ground. He grabbed some sticks, he held them in his hand. And he said, I swear by God, you see the size of these small sticks? What you just said is exactly what Jesus would preach. And even the size of this stick, there is no discrepancy between what you said and what Jesus would preach. Which reveals Najashi did not worship Jesus. He was amongst those Christians who were truly muwahideen. They believed in Allah and they also followed the path of Jesus the hadith says when, they, when he did that, his aides snorted. They were so upset, what is this? Apparently they did not know that he did not worship Jesus. He told them go, those two men, go back to Quraysh, I'm not releasing these two. And then he said, he made a public declaration, whoever harasses a Muslim in my territory, Whoever slanders a Muslim, whoever condemns a Muslim, I'm, I'll imprison them. I'll deal, I'll deal them with justice. So the Najashi, he gave them a safe refuge. And this was really a big, big victory for the Muslims. The Prophet was very, very happy. Now one person out of these 82, 83 defected and became a Christian, but the others, they kept their faith. Now something happens which causes some Muslims, about 30 of them, to go back to Mecca. Next time we'll examine what that case was. There are some fabrications that the Prophet made a compromise with Quraysh, which encouraged some of them to go back. We'll examine that later.